Hello, I'm Dr. Younger, and I'm director of the Neuroinflammation, Pain, and Fatigue Laboratory. So today the question is, is inflammation the cause of anxiety? This is a follow-up to a video I did a few months ago, and that video was called When Inflammation Causes Depression. Now, in the previous video, I showed where in the brain inflammation can cause depressed mood and what parts of the brain we would target if we're trying to treat inflammatory driven depression. So depression is a very common consequence of inflammation. And we suspect given all the studies that have been done by my group and other groups that about 35% of people who have major depressed mood have a condition that's being caused by chronic inflammation. And so treating those cases of depression may involve using novel anti-inflammatory treatments. So definitely watch that earlier video on depression if you want that information. But when I did that video, the question came up, well, what about anxiety? Can chronic inflammation cause anxiety? If it can cause depression, why not anxiety? So I thought that was a question worth answering. And that's what I'm doing in this video. Now I'm going to give the short answer first, and then I'm going to go over the caveats and the exceptions. So the short answer is the relationship between inflammation and anxiety is much weaker than the relationship between inflammation and depression. So if I inject someone with lipipolysaccharide, and lipipolysaccharide is a chemical we use that activates the immune system. So it will engage your inflammatory response for about four hours, and we do this in the laboratory in the hospital. So when I inject someone with lipipolysaccharide, that will cause depressed mood. And the depression will be correlated with the dosage I give. So if I give a little bit of LPS, it'll be slightly depressed mood. If I give more of it, the mood will be depressed even more. So depression is a normal response to infection and to inflammation. We see that whether we do it in patients like with fibromyalgia or ME-CFS or healthy, um, everyone shows that. In fact, groups that do animal studies, they see it in animals as well. So this is a very well-known consequence of inflammation. You have depressed mood. But anxiety reactions are less common. So anxiety doesn't seem to be a um, absolutely important aspect of the typical sickness response. So that's what we see in the lab. We just don't see a lot of anxiety where we do see a lot of temporarily depressed mood. Now, the same thing happens if we leave the lab and we do kind of more larger population studies in different populations. We just don't see a strong relationship. We can measure inflammation by measuring things like C-reactive protein in the blood, and then we can see how anxious they are with self-report measures, but the two don't seem to be correlated. So when I look at my own data sets, I don't see a strong relationship between inflammation and anxiety. And other papers from other groups, they generally don't find strong relationships either. So I'm going to show you one related example just to kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about. Now, this right here is from a poster presented last week uh, by my undergraduate student, Bailey. This is her first research presentation. Um, now, she was looking at a relationship between C-reactive protein, which is systemic inflammation, and post-traumatic stress syndrome, or PTSD. And she looked at this in veterans of the Persian Gulf War. So PTSD is not considered an anxiety disorder, but it is related. There is some overlaps with anxiety. And I basically want to show this, one, because we just released it and I like to show new data. And two, the relationship is similar to what I see with more typical anxiety conditions. I have another student who's looking at more typical anxiety and inflammation right now, and I'll present that very soon. But anyway, this one is showing uh, the correlation between a measure of PTSD called the PCLM, and that's the PTSD checklist military version. And they're looking at over 130 individuals, so a good, strong study. And she just wanted to know if people with higher PTSD also have higher inflammation measured by higher C-reactive protein. So when we see this, um, what, what you're looking at here is uh, a scatter plot. So every blue circle is a 
person who came into our lab and then, well, actually all these people did local lab quest or lab core quest lab. So these people didn't come into my location. They went to a lab close to their home, um, but they all do the same uh, processes. So cl just general clinical blood draws here. So this is a scatter plot of 130, I think 131 veterans. And at the bottom axis, the x-axis is the PTSD. And as you get scores around 60, that's pretty severe PTSD. And then on the y-axis, on, on the left, is the C-reactive protein. And the closer you get to 10, the higher your systemic inflammation is. So we were expecting a positive correlation, meaning that the more inflammation you have, the more PTSD symptoms you have. But that's not what uh, we found in this data set. The relationship is quite small. In fact, it's a slight inverse relationship, a slight negative relationship, and it's not significant. It's a uh, P equals 0.3, and we have to have a P of below 0.05 for it to be considered significant, which this is not. So we do not see any relationship here. Um, what I'm showing right now with this red line, this is a, I just made up this line. The slope would need to look more like this for it to be a significant positive correlation between the two, which again is not what we're seeing here. Now what that means is if you have an anxiety disorder, inflammation is not the first place we would Look, and there are many, many studies. This, this, uh, what I just showed you is pro it's not the best example of that, but uh, we may go over that those data at another time. But I'm just saying, if you look at the whole literature, it agrees with what uh, I've found in my own data sets and what I've showed right here, which is generally your first stop is not inflammation. Uh, there are other things that you would investigate first. There are other more likely causes of your anxiety. Uh, now there are a few exceptions, and I I hate to give a general finding without listing at least a few of the caveats. So let me do four of them. There's probably more, but here's the four main ones. So if you have exceptionally high inflammation, if you're very sick, which means your core temperature has gone up quite a bit and your heart rate is uh, running pretty fast, you're more likely to have anxiety associated with that sickness response. Also, if that uh, related to that, if the inflammation is in a very dangerous place, so if the inflammation is uh, severe and it's in your brain, like meningitis, that is more likely to cause anxiety as well. So there are some sickness responses that will cause anxiety. Second one is if the inflammation is in your gut, that is more likely to cause anxiety. So we have a really complex system of neurons in the gut that we call the enteric uh, nervous system, and that's often called the second brain, is very complex, and it is surrounding your your gut. I'm going to show a little image here of what it looks like. We're not going to go into that in depth in this talk. We may talk about that in another time, but this allows really complex communication between the gut and the brain, and when there's inflammation in the gut, it can trigger anxiety by triggering anxiety responses in the brain via this uh, gut-brain connection. So that's another thing. If you have uh, irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease or something that's really affecting gut, that is more likely to cause anxiety. Now, the third one is if you have a pre-existing anxiety disorder. So if you have generalized anxiety disorder, for example, inflammation or infection can very easily trigger an anxious response or it can exacerbate the, the anxiety. So if your brain is already responding to stimuli with anxiety, additional inflammation can definitely make that worse. And then the fourth one is, now this one I don't have huge data sets on. I only have this data on 30, maybe 40 people, but it looks like that individuals with chronic diseases like fibromyalgia or ME-CFS even if they don't typically have anxiety, they seem to me to respond to infection with more anxious responses. Again, when I inject them with lipopolysaccharide, they're more likely to show an anxious response. Again, even if they don't typically have anxiety. I suspect what's happening in these cases is their microglia have already been sensitized. And so the inflammation is enough to push the microglia activity over the edge 
to release the pro-inflammatory chemicals in certain parts of the brain that cause the anxiety. Um, what brain region am I talking about? Uh, the region that we're most interested in in this case is the basal lateral amygdala. And let me show you where this is right here. So this is a uh, side view of the brain cut in half. So we're kind of looking at the, the midline again from the side. So it's looking uh, toward the left on this. And the amygdala is this small little structure right here. It's kind of this uh, golden almond shaped structure. That's the amygdala. Now there's an amygdala on the left and in the right. And the basal lateral amygdala is an even smaller part of this structure. So we're talking about a really tiny part of the brain. So when we talk about, or when I talk about neuromodulatory interventions like deep brain stimulation or ultrasound targeted drug delivery that can get a drug to a specific brain region, when we're doing that for anxiety, that's the region that we would be targeting. So the bottom line is with anxiety, inflammation is not the most typical cause. And in most cases, anti-inflammatory drugs are probably not going to fix the anxiety, but there are some important exceptions. So we have a lot of data in FM and MECFS and Gulf War illness and some in long COVID that we're still analyzing. I'll be talking about all those results soon. So this is a developing story. This is just a little piece of it right here. So I hope that's helpful to you and uh, thanks for tuning in and I'll talk to you soon.